Good morning, family. How are we doing this morning? Will you stand to your feet with me this morning? If you are here live or you're here on live stream, we believe you're here for a reason this morning. So lift your hands with me. Father God, we thank you for this service, God. We pray that you will pour out on us this morning and tonight. God, we are expecting for you to move here, that chains will be broken. Thank you, Jesus. We expect you to be here with us this morning. We're ready to give you all the praise and all the glory and all of our worship today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Pour 
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Man, the Holy Spirit is moving here this morning. And I feel like that verse is so, so beautiful because of who you are. I will lift our voice and say, and I believe that's what we're doing here this morning. So I want to sing that one more time. That verse, because of who you are, we worship you because of who you are. So let me sing that one more time. Because of who you are, I give you glory. Are you glad to be in the presence of the Lord? Come on, give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout under God with the voice of triumph. Yes! When I give God a clap offering, I like to put the devil's head between my hands. Hallelujah! Give, give him a migraine that he can't get rid of. Well, let's make our Psalm 91 decree. There's power. When we decree a thing, and this is such a psalm of promise, are you ready? All right. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress. My God, in you I will trust. Surely you shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler, and from the perilous pestilence, you shall cover me with your feathers, and under your wings I shall take refuge. Your truth shall be my shield and buckler. I shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at our side, 10,000 at our right hand, but it shall not come near me. Only with my eyes shall I look and see the reward of the wicked, because I have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, my dwelling place. No evil shall befall me, nor shall any plague come near my dwelling. For you shall give your angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways. Into your hands they shall bear me up, lest I dash my foot against a stone. I shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. I shall trample underfoot, because I've set my love upon you. Therefore you will deliver me. You will set me on high because I've known your name. I shall call upon you, and you will answer me. You will be with me in trouble. You will deliver me and honor me with long life. You will satisfy me and show me your salvation. Amen. Amen. 
We want to welcome all of you to Greater Works, and uh, this is our Sunday morning service. I'm Pastor Gary Mitrick, but we are honored and blessed to have a dear, dear special guest in the house. Would you just join me in giving a Greater Works welcome to Bishop Bill Hammond. Come on, just welcome him. Hallelujah. Yes. You may be seated, everyone. Thank you. We've had his daughter-in-law and son here many, many times, Jane Hammond and her husband, but this is his first time here, and we're going to turn him loose this morning. I feel the ghost in the house this morning. Come on, somebody. I love when the woman with the issue of blood reached out and touched the hem of the Lord's garment. And Jesus said, who touched me? And the, the disciples said, Lord, everybody's touching you. He said, no, no, no. I'm not talking about a physical touch. Somebody put a demand on the anointing, on the virtue, and drew it out of me. I want you to put a demand uh, on the anointing, the prophetic anointing in Bishop Hammond and draw it out of him today. I believe he's got a now re revelant word for this house. Come on, somebody. Amen. Well, just real quick, we're going to be back to Tonight at 7, we will have a nursery. We will have children's ministry. But come on back and get under that corporate anointing. We encourage you to do that. Remember, Tuesday night is Bible study at 7. Wednesday at the well is intercessory prayer. This past week, we would, of course, had our annual Holy Spirit Seminar this would have been our 41st one. Wow. And, of course, we didn't have it last year. We didn't have it this year. But I promise you we're going to have it next year. Amen. Someone said to me last week, and I, that bore witness with my spirit. They said, I, I believe that the Lord's just going to order his own Holy Spirit seminar. Come on. I believe God's ready to break out. I believe God's ready to do something in our region, and I'm ready for it. And then you receive this flyer, if you're here in the house, our Synergy Youth Ministry is hosting an event the weekend of August 6th and 7th. It's an overnight event, Friday night and Saturday, called Manhood Camp. And they need some donations. As you can see, if you have a middle school or a high school teenager, you can register them for this camp today. It's only $10. And if for some reason you cannot afford that, we have had some people donating and sponsoring $10 for some teens to come. And so there's teenagers coming from all over the city. So they need lots of various donations. They're listed there. We appreciate your help with them. And uh, Pastor Danny, of course, will be out in the lobby after the service today if you need more information about that. Well, we are going to receive our morning tithes and offerings. Come on, God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. He loves a hilarious, cheerful giver. And uh, we've got an update on our parking lot expansion. I believe Dave told me last week they are going to be starting it, all the renovations, sometime maybe this week. So we only need down to $4,251. So if you need a gold envelope, 
or if you're watching us uh, live stream, you can designate a gift for the expanded parking lot. If you're here in the house, we're going to pray. You can make your checks payable to Greater Works. If you prefer or like to do your giving by credit or debit card, the Resource Center in the lobby will be open after the service. We are just receiving one offering. This is our only offering this morning. And Chaz has some numbered envelopes. If any of you would like to help us, either with a $1,000 gift or a $100 gift to help us defray our expenses, you can come down and get an envelope or just hold up your hand. We have a deliverance ministry. We'll deliver it right to you. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for as we honor you with our first fruits, our tithes, and our offerings. We put it into the good ground, the fertile soil of the ministry. We ask you, Lord, to bless it, multiply it, use it for the advancement of your kingdom and the furthering of the gospel. Meet every need in this house. We declare a summer jump and not a summer slump. And we call every need met in our personal houses and lives as well. In Christ's name we pray. And everybody said, if you are watching us live stream or Facebook live on the lower third of your screen, there are various ways for you to give. Thank you for your faithfulness. Let's worship the Lord while you prepare your offering. Saturday was silent. Surely it was through. But since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment. Sunday's empty tomb. But since when has impossible ever stopped you? This is all stand together in the house lay your hand on your tithe if you're tithing on your offering and gift God promises to bless everything you put your hand to and I bless you with the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and God you add no sorrow to your blessing in our lives in Jesus Christ's name and everybody said all right come on carrying something special today. My, my, my. I like it. Remain standing for our corporate prayer time. Remember, after Bishop Hammond is finished ministering this morning, we will have prayer partners available down here in the front. How many of you believe there's a healer in the house this morning? Come on, Jehovah Rapha is in the house. So come on down. And uh, just if a chair is available, sit in one. Someone will personally and individually pray with you. If you need anointed for healing, they will do that. 
If you need a prayer of agreement, they will pray with you for that. But uh, we want to keep uh, Rick Teehee in prayer. Rick's wife, Danette, went home to be with the Lord. We did her, she had a glorious homegoing service yesterday. We did that yesterday morning. We're praying for, uh, with a Sally Blend for her sister. She is uh, also just uh, seems close to be going home to be with the Lord, but she's in the Lord's hands. Maggie Awuso, we prayed for Maggie last week. Her brother back in Africa went home to be with the Lord. So Maggie traveled there. She's over there right now. Let's pray for her protection and safety. Uh, Bill Helsley, Bill, I hear you shouting. Amen. Bill, Bill had surgery this past week. It's good to see you back in the house. We're praying for a full, speedy, supernatural, miraculous recovery for you, sir. Amen. Peggy Carr's mom uh, is battling Parkinson's and needs healing. And Pastor Gerard's sister, Annie, who lives up in New York, is in the hospital. She needs healing. And let's remember, we're, we're praying for Haiti. We've had a work down there for 32 years. The president has been assassinated. His wife is in critical condition in the hospital. And uh, there's a lot of chaos. There's a shortage of food and water. We want to pray for protection for our work there, our family there, and just for the whole nation. We need God to just settle that place and restore order. God is not the God of confusion. He's a God of order. Amen? So take whatever's on your heart. Father, we lift every person, every need, every situation up to the throne of grace. Lord, those that need healing that are here in the house and those that are watching, there's no distance in the Holy Spirit. We send the word to you right now. Be healed. Be delivered. Be restored. We pray for you, Bill, for the Lord to touch you. Sally, we pray for your sister. Lord, comfort Maggie and her family. Comfort Rick and his family. Wrap your loving arms around them, Lord. We send the word to Annie up in New York and to Peggy's mom. Lord, come upon them right where they are and deliver them. Set them free. And Lord, we lift up our family in Haiti. Put the angel of the Lord round about our campus there. Protect our girls, our school, our staff. We bind confusion, violence, gangs, murders, kidnappings, all that is going on on that island. Restore, restore peace and order, Lord, we pray. Father, we pray for every need that is strong on our hearts. It's not by might. It's not by power, but it is by the Holy Spirit. And Satan, you are bound over our lives, over our families, our children. Keep our children safe throughout the summer. Those that are traveling and vacationing, grant traveling mercies, Lord. And for all of us, you know what we're needing and what we're believing for, Lord, hear the cry of our hearts. Hear the cry of the righteous, we pray, and deliver us and set us free in Jesus Christ's name. Come on, let's thank him for hearing and answering our prayers. Amen. I'm going to just ask you to remain standing for just one more moment. Dr. Bill Hammond is the founder of Christian International Ministries. He has been a prophet for over 60 years. 
And he has prophesied to more than 75,000 people. And he's provided training for over 500,000 in prophetic ministry. He has authored seven major books specializing in the restoration of the church and what to expect next on God's agenda. Dr. Bill Hammond is respected by church leaders around the world. He's the senior leader of the prophetic apostolic company God is raising up in these last days. He was recently featured by Charisma Magazine as one of the 40 people who have radically changed the world. Isn't that pretty oppressive? He serves as bishop to over 900 ministries and churches in the United States, as well as over 3,000 ministries overseas via Christian International's headquarters around the world. You know what that tells me? He could be a lot of places this morning, but I'm thanking God he's right here. Amen. Amen. Dr. Hammond resides in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. He has three children, 11 grandchildren, and 20 great-grandchildren. And he travels with an anointed prophet and dear brother, Wilt Bernard. Would you welcome Wilt to the house as well? Amen. So... As we open our hearts and our spirits to whatever the Lord wants to do this morning and tonight, I hope you come back because he's going to have more ministry tonight. But I want you to give a great, great welcome to Dr. Bill Hammond. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hallelujah. <clears throat> Everywhere I go, I like to give a hallelujah to let the devil know I'm going to help him fulfill his destiny. Right. The lake of fire. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Um, tonight, I'm going <clears> to <throat> share from my 14th book, my latest book. It's, it's the subject that I've mentioned over the years, but I thoroughly covered it here. Um, what I tell people, this is the book that, in truth, I would preach if I only had one hour left to teach my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and any friends and relatives and ministers I had. Because if you don't get this truth, all the rest doesn't, matter, doesn't amount to much. And that's uh, your highest calling. And, uh, and it's very important. So I want to invite you back tonight on that. And um, in fact, uh, um, Will made a little introduction because I've, I've developed a teaching on this, and uh, Will wanted to show us a little introduction to it. Uh, do you have that ready, brother? A little video. I'm not used to this IT stuff. They they get, they get all these ideas. <laughs> We've only had one hour left. This is what I want to tell you. Most people know that the highest calling is to be conformed to Christ's image. What, what they don't know is the process of conformity and the law of transformation. My latest book that I wrote called Your Highest Calling, the truths that are in that book is what I'd want to share with my children, my grandchildren, my family, my friends or loved ones, because the truth in that book is so essential. You know, I've taught the prophetic and activated people in the prophetic, and we've got half a million people we've trained and equipped, and uh, we've launched people in ministry, and other great men are doing great things for God. But if you don't learn the character, nature, and think like God thinks, Paul and Jesus both said that you could prophesy, cast out devils, have the greatest ministry, and if you didn't have the love character of Christ, it profits you nothing. 
No. The Bible says he that finds a wife finds a good thing. And my wife was a good thing. She had a beautiful face, cute little worst line and all of that, long, beautiful flowing hair. The thing that impressed me was her wisdom and common sense she had. And through our life, she has taught me consistency, keep believing God. And she taught me about the seasons of life. And that's a lot of what's in my book. Even I quote her uh, in, in the Slice book on your highest calling. And she was the making of the ministry in my life. And so when she departed, God's grace had to increase in me to be able to keep going. And we're still gonna go on until the end and on and on, amen. Most people know my father as, as a father in the prophetic. And that's what he's best known as around the world. My father brought the prophetic into not only our family, but into the church and into many other places around the world. And yet we can still be what I say call us real people. Uh, we, it's okay to be prophetic and go to a football game. It's okay to be prophetic and have a sense of humor. And that legacy, I think, is what has been probably the most to me over time. Uh, many other things he's taught as well, but that part really means a lot to me. And my dad taught me all my life that, you know, things weren't as important as your relationship with God, because that is our end goal, is to be conformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. My favorite thing about my papa would be his fearlessness. Um, his fearlessness to do anything he puts his mind to, and his fearlessness to also say whatever comes to his mind sometimes. My grandfather has taught me a lot. He was always just great at what he did. He, he never let fear or anything take him away from that. I feel like um, he's taught all of us, um, not just his children, but the people that he's mentored as well, how to really hear the voice of the Lord and how to really know and grow your relationship with the Lord and how to listen. Me. You love me? <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Come on, join me on this journey. I'm going to activate you. You're going to learn how to overcome. You'll quit asking why. You'll never get discouraged like this again. And you'll press on and hear the words, well done, good, and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. I know that's what you want to hear. God bless you with truth and life and hope and faith. Love you. Bless you, bunch. This electric, uh, you know, 2020, I traveled around the world. I zoomed around the world, but it didn't gain any more freaking flyer miles. <laughs> but we zoomed on the Zoom. Amen. Well, it's a joy to be here. I guess my daughter-in-law, Jane, has been how many, how many heard Jane preach? Did I, did, did, I, did I do a good job training and mentoring her up? <laughs> good, good. She's a blessing. Amen. Um, I, I want to I encourage you to be back tonight. Um, how many has had at least one experience in your life where you wondered, why did that happen to me? Why did they have to go through that? How many has got a why? How many would like to know the why? Once you hear this message tonight, you'll never ask why again. You'll understand why. And you need to understand the process. And uh, I know... Um, uh, you know, in different ages, you have different perspectives. Uh, I was looking out over the audience, reminded me back in 1964, I was teaching in a Bible college. I was 33 years old, and they asked me to go over and preach at this church. Well, my wife and I went over. Uh, she was 30, and I was 33. And, and I looked around, and man, they're all gray-headed and bald-headed. And, and I, I said, man, they all look like they're 60 and older. And I thought, Lord, what am I going to say to these people? They're all got one foot on the banana peel and hanging on to a slip rope and they're over the hill, you know. And I, and I, I was really serious, 33 years old, because I was preaching and teaching in a Bible college in the 17 to 25 average age. And so I, I said, Lord, what am I? And those people shouted, praise God, went on to one o'clock, finally turned me loose, and I preached a miracle message, nine minutes. And, but the Lord gave me one thought, and I just drove at home. As long as there's breath in your body, there's purpose for you to be alive on planet Earth. Amen? Amen. Now, since I'm 87, 60 doesn't sound so old. 
<laughs> How many here are 60 or older? Wave your Look at that. All right. Is anybody 40 and under? <laughs> Three or four? <laughs> okay. We, we, we need a new generation coming in. Amen? All right. Push, I'm sure you got them, but they come at different times. All right. But I, I want to share with you God's purpose. Uh, you know, everything God does is on purpose. He, he, he wasn't working in his laboratory one day and something fell on the floor and popped up a man and said, ooh, what do I do with that? Uh, God plans and purposes everything he does. And um, Ephesians 3, uh, 10 says, God does everything according to his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus. How many would like to believe that everything that happened in your life could work together for your betterment, for your success, for your conformity to the image of Christ? How many would like to believe that no matter what the devil threw at you, what happened, it's going to work for your good? There's only two requirements you have to meet. Romans 8, 28, 29 says, we know, and when Apostle Paul says we know, just read 2 Corinthians 11 of all the things Apostle Paul went through. He was beaten with 39 stripes five times, beaten with rods. I was raised on a farm in Oklahoma, and my dad, you know, my religious background is American heathen. I, I was never inside of a church before I got saved at an old brush over meeting in the hills of Oklahoma. And, and my dad had a sixth grade education, and he only understood one thing, work, work, sun up to sundown on a 300-acre farm of cotton, peanuts, and corn. And, um, you know, and so I, I didn't know anything about anything about God, and I didn't know about heaven or hell or religion or people or things, and thank God he, he saved me, man. I'm glad. To, I'm glad when the, the bus driver, I was riding a bus to high school, and we had to go five miles, and, and he kicked me off the bus and said, that boy's going to be a murderer or a preacher. I'm glad I turned out to be a preacher. <laughs> Amen. So you've got some grandchildren or children that are stubborn, bullheaded, and ornery, just hang in there to pray for them. There's still hope. <laughs> Praise God. And, uh, <clears throat> and Ephesians 1, 9 says that, Jesus does everything, God does everything according to his good pleasure and for his own purpose. And, and, and God has a purpose in everything he does. And um, I, um, I, I want to cover it so much. Um, i got a ring there. I hope you can get it. I don't know what I'm doing. Listen, um, how many how many have been saved over five years? Keep your hand up along to you. Ten? Fifteen? Who will make it twenty? Twenty-five? Thirty? Who will make it forty? <laughs> 40? I say 40. 50? 55? 60? 65? 70? That's where I stopped, 70. You're saved. But um, I got saved at 16, and uh, I turn 87 next week. And so, praise God. Amen. And this is my 68 years of ministry. How many here were not on planet Earth 68 years ago? I don't care if you are. All right. Praise God. Well, you know, when you first start preaching, you look and look for something to preach. After preaching years and years, you look for, look for what not to preach. And, uh, you know, and so I've written 14 books uh, over there. My main ministry over the years is revelation of God's timing and purposes. Uh, like the first book I wrote called The Eternal Church covers all the church history of 2,000 years, and especially the 500 years of church restoration from 500 A.D. Uh, to f from 1500 A.D. to 2007. And I've written books on all of those movements. And, um, but the main thing I like to cover is why God created man. Uh, how many were born in this world? Just a couple of hats on a stump, but I don't buzz it over there. But anyhow, we got into this world by birth, and you came into this world for a purpose. I said, God has a purpose for you. And, and then when you're born again, you have the DNA of God, and you're born into a purpose. There's no such thing as a person that's a Christian, born again Christian, that doesn't have a purpose in God. There's something God wants you to do. And, and Paul illustrates that by 1 Corinthians 12, when he says, we are the body of Christ and members in particular. And he says, the hand can't say to the eye, I don't need you, or the nose say, I don't need you. Or the, I mean, he says, everyone is special and has his part. You may be different and unique, 
uh, you know, when God made you, he made a brand new mold, and as soon as he finished it, threw it away and said, never again. You're one of a kind. Now take that according to your perception, I guess. How many know you're one of a kind? And I think the biggest thing the devil works on with saints is try to convince you you're not important, you're not valuable, you're not needed, you're especially you're never behind the pulpit, nobody knows your name, you're just a little old nobody. There was no such thing as nobodies in God's kingdom. There's no big eyes and little U's in God's kingdom. I tell you, my father-in-law, who was our maintenance man at the college for years, you know, he got a pain in his back. He, had, he was 68 years, 67 years old. I mean, he, he could do carpenter work, electrical work. Uh, he had a heart like a 21-year-old, they said, but one microscopic cell in his colon backslid and turned from a life-giving cell to a cancer cell. And it worked in the darkness of the colon, and, with, and he started getting pain in his back, tried to exercise more, thought maybe, he did. but anyhow, long story short, it broke out, and he went to the doctor. They thought he had um, uh, another problem, and they opened him up and then wasn't prepared and found out the cancer had spread throughout his uh, internal organs. So they sewed him back up, sent him home to die, and six weeks later, he was in heaven. Now, those eyes that could see, those hands that could work, those heart that could beat, all that body was stopped because of one microscopic cell in the colon. Now, you may feel like a microscopic cell stuck away. Nobody knows who you are or what you are, but you're important. I said, you're important. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're important. We need you. We need one another. We're members one of another. And one thing it is, you got to learn. I had to learn it the hard way. When I, I got Bible college I attended in Portland, Oregon, that president gave us a vision that we were to turn the world upside down. We were the generation that was going to finish it all and do it all and be it all and fulfill it all. And man, I came out of that Bible college, I was like, watch, watch out, here I come. And, and I, wanted, I, I wanted God to make Oral Roberts, Betty Graham, William Branham, and, and all the, my, I want all them rolled together in Bill Hammond. But you know what? You can't be everybody. And, and, and I'd, 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 watch, I'd watch Oral Roberts on television back in the 50s, since one of the only few on television then. And, and I think, God, I'm doing nothing. He's doing all of this. And, and, and finally, the Lord said, Bill Hammond, why don't you find out what I've called you to do, what I've called you to be, and when you do, you'll be so busy fulfilling that you'll have time to be jealous or envious or feel less than others. There's no greater important or less important members in the body of Christ. Come on. I said everybody's important. <laughs> and, and, you, and you need to know that. And you're not rewarded based on how much you do. You're not rewarded on how many. Like I've written 14 books, traveled to 70 nations, you know, been in the ministry 68 years, built Christian International, all the ministers around the world. But that's not my reward. It'll be some, it's how faithful I am to what God's given me. You see, it's, it's like the talents, five, two, and one. How many know the story? You know, one was given five, another was given two, another one. And the one that had the five, say, if it's, we'll make it money where you can under, make it more real, he got $5,000. And the master said, I'm going away, occupy till I come. And the guy that had the five, that's in Matthew 25, 15 through 30, and then one that had five went out and bought a donkey that almost died. He got it well and traded it and worked that and that. And finally, he ended up doubled. He almost went bankrupt two or three times probably. But he kept trading. Come on. Some of you want God to do it all. God said, do what you can. Keep going. And if you fail and it looks like it's not going to work, get up and go again. Keep on going. I mean, when you, when you hear some of the stories I went through, and some that you've gone through, you'll find out it all works together for making the man and God's purpose and plan in your life. Amen. Amen. And so, I remember when I was in Bible college, they had prophetic presbytery. How many know what prophetic presbytery is? Where several ministers get together, and they lay hands on you and prophesy over you. And they did to me. And one of the phrases in that three-page prophecy was, said, Yea, my son, I've even kept you under my own purpose. Now, I must have read that prophecy over the next 30 years at least a thousand times, but I never could understand 
I've kept you under my own purpose. I didn't know what the purpose was. I know it's to preach, pray, prophesy, pray for the sick, cast up devils, raise the dead, do everything I could do. But I didn't know what my purpose was. How many know this church is called for a purpose? You're called for a purpose. You're not here by accident. Amen. I mean, you, you raised this church up for the Lord, right? It's his church. It's his ministry. I'm, I see I as God's ministry. I'm his, and I belong to him. And my, my daughter wrote a book called uh, Short in Your Best Life, showing you, you own nothing. God owns you. Therefore, he owns all you have. He owns your money. He owns your house. He owns your car. He owns your wife. He owns your husband. And one wife said, good, I'll give him to her. <laughs> but, but we're the stewards of what God's given us. Amen. And we need to realize that. Now, when God made man, how many believe God really created man? We didn't evolve from a monkey and or something. Those that believe that may have evolved from a monkey. But uh, God created man, and he had purpose and design. He had created seraphim aeons ago, and they were kind of a little bit robotish. They continued to say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, day and night. And then he created cherubims and had those great big wings, and, and they protected things and overshadowed things. And they were pretty good, but that wasn't fully what he wanted. And then he made angels. And it was a little closer to what he wanted. And um, they looked more like the type of creatures he was wanted. But that still didn't satisfy him. And he had millions and millions of creatures to fellowship with. Uh, in my book on why God created man, I mentioned uh, eight reasons why God created the human race. And um, I don't say I had it here. But... Um, I, when I taught in Bible college, I had a question I had the students fill out. One of the questions was, why did God create man? Did you ever ask yourself that? Did you ever wondered that? Why did God create the human race? Out of 500 questionnaires I ended up receiving, 98% had the same answer. Either God created man for worship, because he's lonely, oh God, sitting there on a the throne, my own whiskers, I'm lonely, I need somebody to tell me how great I am. Or he created for fellowship because he had nobody to talk to as a lonely woman. But God had trillions of angels and billions of cherubim serve him. And those are number seven and number eight, fellowship and praise and worship. But there's six before that more meaningful and personal to God for why he created this human race. You were created on purpose to accomplish a purpose. Let me say that. They didn't get it over here. You were created on purpose not just to go to church and worship God and go home. You've got ministry in you. You've got talent in you. You've got divine nature in you. And everyone here is called to do something for the kingdom and contribute something to the body of Christ. It may be just making little things for people. It may be a gift of helps. It may be mercy. It may be healing. It, it could be small or great in man's eyes. But the thing that's important, everything is great in God's eyes. It's not important what you do, it's how well you do what you're called to. Amen. And I had to, I had to work for years to quit comparing myself to Oral Roberts and Billy Graham and uh, these other great men of God that's touching millions. And then I'm a his church historian and I read about these great men of God that, uh, like John Wesley, preached to 18,000 sermons and touched over 10 million people way back in the 1700s. And then I think, oh, God, what have I done? You know, I, and, but you don't compare yourself with others. Amen. Paul said, they that compare themselves among themselves are not very smart. <laughs> I won't use the word he used. He said, he said kind of like stupid or not, not very smart, you know. I am, Paul said, I am who I am, what? By the grace of God. You know, that's the reason you can't take pride in your accomplishment. You, you, you can't take your success as, look what I've done. If God gives you success, there was even a worldly king got to say, and he was the head of an empire, 120 nations, and he would go around saying, I built this, I did this, I did. Nebuchadnezzar, king of a whole Babylonian empire, and God said, prophet, go tell him that if he keeps bragging on what he's done, I'm going to take him down because I helped him become this head of this great empire. And this was a worldly empire. And so, sure enough, a year later, 
Here the king is out there, Nebuchadnezzar's out there, Kevin is guy, I built this, I did this, I did this, I did this. And then he's, and the prophet came and said, you're doing it. And God said, you shouldn't do it. Now you're going to have fulfilled the prophecy. And seven years, he was like an animal in the, out in the woods. Amen. And, uh, you know, you don't take the glory. And then now get the other side of it, though. How many has ever felt like you failed and something didn't work out and you felt bad? All right. My wife got a revelation one time. Uh, she was reading over there about Moses and the tabernacle. And, and she got realized it. And, and, and she was fussed about something. And God said, if that had worked and been successful, would you have taken the glory? She said, of course not, Lord. I give you all the glory. Well, why are you taking the blame? Because I didn't let it work out. <laughs> Come on. How many, how many are a little bit self-critical? Come on. You, you, you just give yourself a bad time. I, I, I was that way. I mean, the devil stayed home and let me do all his work for me. When <laughs> I, I would beat myself up and criticize. But, you know. You need to know that God has a purpose for you. And God has a purpose for the church. You know, as I said, I've written this, all these books on the Restoration Movement, on the First and Second and Third Reformation. The First Reformation was the birthing of the church, the establishing of the church on proper doctrine and, and God's truths, and then it spread it to the ends of the earth. That took the first three or four hundred years. Then as Peter and Paul and Jesus predicted, the church would decline, People would come in and deaden it and do away with its power and glory. And that started, that started in about 500 A.D. And of course, it was the Dark Age from 500 to 1500, a thousand year Dark Age. History, history calls it the Dark Age. Culturally, they call it the Dark Age. And spiritually, it was the Dark Age. And all the truths in the New Testament that the new ch church had was deadened into religious. I said, was anybody in a Catholic here? Anybody? Uh, nobody ever was a Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. Okay. Uh, you know, you did a lot of ritual. It's kind of nice. It makes you feel religious. But they don't teach about being born again or a lot of things. Amen. And so it, 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 it had lost it all. Well, some people, there's a, there is a teaching that Jesus can't come until the great falling away. Well, we had a thousand years of it, and it didn't come close to rapturing that church out. But it did start something. It started the Second Reformation. And it started restoring the church, and we have the Protestant movement in 1500 that got us out of dead theology and dead religion and living faith. And Martin Luther had a born-again experience, and the, out of that, the Lutheran Church, Episcopalian and Presbyterian Church was started. Back in 1500, and we had the evangelical movement in 1600 with your Baptists and uh, the Puritans and all that. And that truths were restored in 1700s. You had the West Side Methodists, you had the Holiness Movement, and the Nazarenes and all those Holiness churches that taught sanctification, holiness, victorious living. Then 1800, you had the Healing Movement, where A.B. Simpson got the revelation that healing is for the body as well as the soul. How many believe healing is for your body today? Do you know why you believe it? Somebody got a revelation. Amen. Somebody preached it and got kicked out of their church because they did. Come on. And, but he, all these, when they, once they got the truth, they had to move out of the church to fulfill that truth. But now God's fulfilling it so fast, you can just keep adding. And then we had the Pentecostal movement in 1900, and where God restored the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence speaking in other tongues. And from that, you had your Assembly of God, Church of God, Pentecostal holiness, uh, Church of God in Christ, and on and on. And then in 1948, God moved again to restore more back to the church and restored the teaching that there's apostles and prophets in the church today. Up to 1948, 99% of the church world did not believe that there are present-day apostles and prophets in the church. Do you believe in apostles and prophets in this church? Yes. Do you know why you do? Somebody got a revelation and started preaching. And the Restoration Brethren of that time started teaching and preaching. But none of them would take the title. I was raised up among that group in the West Coast uh, from 1954 to 1964. And um, then I moved to teaching the Bible College in San Antonio, Texas. But they wouldn't take the title. But in 1988, 40 years later, when the prophetic movement was birthed at our conference in Sandestin, Florida, we started introducing people as prophet so-and-so or apostle so-and-so because I wanted to make the apostle and prophet as active, as real, as a part of the church, as evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Amen. How many know that Ephesians 4, 11 says, Jesus 
went to heaven and took all of his ministries to the church and divided into five giftings or graces and anointed, and, his, and he gave names to them. If he had asked me, I said, Lord, don't give names to them. Everybody want to be the, what they think is the greatest. <laughs> That's reason everybody wants to be the apostle but, because he's supposed to be the greatest. No, they're just five. And I don't see where anyone's over the other. Now, they all each have their specialties. And, uh, and so, and he gave them to the church for the equipping of the church. And I try to tell pastors around the world, our main calling as fivefold ministers is not to write books, preach ministers, travel the world, and build great cathedrals. Our number one calling is to equip you to fulfill your ministry in the body of Christ. Oh, yes. Amen. <laughs> Many a minister will have to stand before God and say, you had those people 20 years. Did you develop in them? Well, I preached to them. I got them paying their tithes. I got them sanctified. They came to church every Sunday. That's good. That's faithfulness. But listen, you've got something to contribute. Your presence is even important. You know, and, and it's a difference of maturity and immaturity. Mat immaturity says, well, I don't think there were very many there tonight. We'll stay home. You know, maturity says, look, there'll probably just be a few there. The pastors are going to need all the help and, and work he can. Let's go. Are you with me? Yes, now, are you living to fulfill yourself or fulfill God's will and God's purpose? And God's raising up a church. And let me tell you, I've, in, in, in 2020, I was on a Zoom with about 150 prophets around the world. And, we, and discussing with all of them, we're all of the same witness. Of, we're on the edge of the greatest move of God that's ever taken place on planet Earth. Amen. And I, I found that as a prophet of God, God only has me at his place in church. They work like midwives because evidently God said, this church is getting ready for transition to a whole new realm of God, whole new de development of God, whole new glory of God. Amen. And you're, you're about to move into a realm and God wants you to get ready for it. And a prophet comes in to be a midwife to help you birth. Amen. How many, how many of us, you know, here I am, 87. Now, I won't be 100 for another 13 years. <laughs> you know, uh, um, when my, um, I'll get this done right here. Come up here and fix it. I told him to put on the right hand because I lose my left, but I guess I use, it takes both my hands to help my mouth talk. I believe in body ministry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <clears throat> about uh, uh, September, it's 2014, my wife was getting sicker and sicker and sicker, and I had thousands praying for her around the world. And <clears throat> finally she got to the place, uh, I told her, honey, you, you got to eat and exercise. And she'd say, uh, I'm not worried about it, I'm ready to go. And what she meant, I want to go to heaven, and so don't try to stop me. But two weeks before she died, Jesus appeared at her bedside, shiny and bright clothing, and he held out his hand to her and lovingly smiled real big at her, but didn't say a word, she said. I said, well, was he conveying to you, you're going to get healed and raised up, or was he welcoming you home? She said, I don't know. But after that, she had no desire to stay on this earth. So I tell people, after 59 years of marriage, a man came by, just smiled at my wife, she took off with him. Now, tonight, I want to really encourage you on this because we're, we're in the last days. How many believe we're in the last days? The last of the last days. And what you saw last year is just a play thing of what's coming. We're going to see world situations beyond your imagination. So if you, didn't, if you didn't handle the COVID very well, you really need to pray up and get through to some bigger victory. Because, but Jesus said the gross darkness will cover the world, but the glory of the Lord is coming upon the church. And, and, the, and the church is going to get brighter and brighter and brighter to the perfect day. I'm excited about this day and hour. And even at 87, I'm still getting prophecies about things I'm going to do yet, and I'm glad of that. How many have prophecies, have had received personal prophecies about your life? How many has got things in your prophecies that have not come to pass yet? Now, that's not bad news. That's good news. The only person that ever told me all their prophecies had come to pass died in three weeks. How many glad you got prophecies that haven't come to pass yet? 
you may be around next year. <laughs> Otherwise, goodbye. <laughs> you know, and, and don't look at your age. Come on, it's just a number. And it's just a number. You know, my, my daughter, my youngest child, my daughter, you saw her picture on there. She just turned 60 in May. And she was so, oh, I'm old. That's, that's terrible. 60, my. You know, 60 years old, but she's getting adjusted. But, you know, I, I said, now, 80 sounds okay, but 90 sounds like I might be getting older. <laughs> we got anybody here in the 80s? Anybody here in the 80s? Right here, one, 80. Anybody else in the 80s? Over here, is there 80? Oh, yeah, you look good, girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I went to the doctor yesterday, had an MRI on my back, about because I get spasms in my hip, I stand or walk very much. And, uh, and uh, uh, he said, well, stand up. What can you do? It's, it's sore there. And he pushed in my back. And then he said, well, how old are you? I said, I'm 87. He said, what are you worried about? You're on board time anyhow. <laughs> I wanted to give him five-fold ministry. <laughs> you know. Usually I ask the Lord, where is this, the church I'm going to be at, regardless of what nation I'm in? And the Lord said, you, you've, been, you've been crossing your Jordan for the last three years, and you've been going through some challenging situations. But God, God said, he's transitioning you from the old to the new, and you're moving into the third and final great reformation. Now, the th I didn't tell you what the third reformation, I'll tell you what the second reformation was, to, for, to restore every spiritual truth in the book that had been lost during the Dark Ages. And, and then in, 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 uh, fifth, in the 50s, we had the restoration movement, and then in the 60s, we had the charismatic renewal. In the 70s, we had the faith movement. And in the 80s, we had the prophetic, apostolic. I had the privilege of being a pioneer, and I helped to be the birthing of that prophetic and our train, train and equip people in it. And then we had the apostolic in the 90s. Then we had the saints movement in the 2007. And then in 2008, heaven announced that the third and final church reformation had begun. And God's transitioning you into the third reformation. And when, when that happens, you get a vision bigger than the local church. And I, and I feel this church already has a vision bigger than the local church. And God's going to expand it, and you start using what you've got. I, I, some of you have been saved 30, 40, 50 years. When are you going to start using what God's given you? Come on. Well, I, well, I don't feel lead. But when people tell me that, I'll give them a lead pencil. I feel this lead, and I'll go do it. <laughs> Obey God. Well, but the pastor hadn't asked me to do anything. Well, when you have to wait till the pastor to go down to Skid Row and preach and pray and prophesy to people or something. If you've got it, you'll find a place to use it. Have you gone to the pastor and said, look, I, I have a burden for this or that and the other? And they said, well, okay, let's pray about that. Let's work toward it. And if God's dealing with you, don't just keep complaining why nobody's doing what you feel burdened for when God's given you the burden and you're the one supposed to be doing it. They didn't get that over here. Let me explain it again. <laughs> What you're complaining and worrying about people not doing is because God's dealing with you to get ready to do it. Yeah. When the prophetic, I started prophesying in 1952, but then I had that divine visitation in 1973 where God released me in endless prophesying. And, uh, uh, you know, and then I started prophesying up to people, uh, about 1,000 people a week for year after year after year. And that's the reason 75,000 is, is a minimal number. And... Uh, but, but I got to saying, somebody needs to write something on the prophetic. And I kept saying, somebody needs to write something on the prophetic. And the Lord said, yes, somebody does, you. <laughs> you've got the burden, you've got the vision, you've got the ministry, write it. So I started writing the book, and I wrote the book on prophets and personal prophecy. Then the prophetic movement was birthed, so I wrote the book on all the 16 things the prophetic movement restored and all of that. And then we started training people, and I found out training saints. Wow, all of a sudden, there's like a bowl of cereal with those nuts and flakes in there. And <laughs> so, so I had to come up with prophetic protocol and pitfalls to avoid and principles to practice and 19 questions and answers on the prophetic that will answer everything you want to ask about it. All this confusion they had about the prophesying about 
when the president was going to be reelected or not, how long the, uh, that, that's all answered here in these first five questions in that. And then the apostolic movement came and wrote the book on the apostolic. Then the day of the saints movement came and wrote the day of the saints. And then the army of the Lord, the great awakening, I covered that, and then the third reformation. Then I wrote the book on the army of the Lord that we are in now, the movement, and the God's weapons of war. Because I want to be progressively where God is. Amen. The walk with the Lord is not a circle. It's from glory to glory, faith to faith, grace to grace, truth to truth, move ahead. Amen. And if you're, if you're, if you're no different than you were five years ago, something needs to shake up. Yes. Come on. And, and, and oh, I'm, I'm still looking forward to doing and being things I've never done before. And I'll, I'll close by saying this, and I'll start closing in the middle of my message. But... Um, uh, Matthew 25 talks about, let me say that there's two things besides sin that can get you in trouble. Now, there's sins in this book here. I talk about how can these things be. A subtitle, a preacher and a miracle worker, but denied heaven. How can these things be? And I talk about how I, I've known many, many preachers in my 68 years that some lived in adultery, some liars, some thieves. Uh, I mean, all kinds, but could preach, pray, prophesy, and go out and live in sin. How can these things be? Because God doesn't honor the man, God honors his word. Yes, sir. And if a man will preach God's word, God will honor his word. But it doesn't mean God's honoring you. Are you with me? So, but I, I bring out that what is sin. I realize I hadn't preached on sin in a long time, so I had to really search it out. We talk about sins of omission and sins of commission. Sins of commission is committing those things, doing the things you shouldn't do. The sins of omission is not doing what you should do. And you can get as much trouble with God for the sins of omission as you can the sins of commission. Now, my wife and I, she was saved when she was three, raised in a Pentecostal church, and everything was a sin but breathing. That had to be done in church. <laughs> Women had to have long sleeves, long dresses, long hair, and long tongues. And because uh, <laughs> you could gossip and tell bears, all right, but just don't wear lipstick earrings, you know, you had to be holy, holy, holy. And, uh, but she, she wasn't ambitious for sin or worldly inclined, lived holy all of her life, got saved at three for the Holy Ghost at seven, married me at 18 when I was 21. She married a preacher, and she married a pastor, and I taught her all the sins she'd ever done this about. But anyhow, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't get her on sins of commission. She just hadn't committed any outward sin. But where I had to get her omission, not reading her Bible like she should, not doing this, not doing that, but the sins of omission. And there's, a, there's one, two sins of omission that I want to talk about one of them, and I'll talk about conformity to the image of Christ tonight and what it does for you. But how many know that five, I talk about the five two and one talents. According to Jesus' teaching and Paul's teaching, Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every saint. How many saints we have here? Uh, just a couple waiting until they die and get in a stained glass window. But a saint, you have a ministry. Come on. Did you know all nine gifts of the Holy Spirit are sitting here in the Holy Ghost bodies? How many has been a tongue talker for more than 20 years? Wow. You know when the Holy Ghost came in, he brought one, two, three, four, five gifts he imparted to you. All gifts are available on need, but we are responsible for a certain one God imparts to us. Come on. And see, if I've been given five gifts, I only use three, I'm in more trouble than you are with two and using both of your two. They, they didn't get that in the middle here now. I said, if I've been given five talents and I'm only using three, but you're only given two, but you're using plus, you're in better shape with God than I am. Come on. It's not well done, good, and half faithful or three-quarters faithful servant, full faithful servant. Now, all nine gifts of the Spirit are in there. You see, the evangelical movement of 1600, the Baptists, started evangelism. And, the, and they developed an activation called the sinner's prayer. How many pray the sinner's prayer? Oh, several Christians here. Amen. How many had somebody lead you in a sinner's prayer when you got saved? Let's see. Somebody, you repeat it. Wave your hand. Let me see. Now, 
do you believe that worked? It must be you're here. Whether it's at a Billy Graham meeting or your pastor or friend led you to the Lord. That's called an activation. In other words, you act on the word and expect to get the results. Amen. Come on. And so what you do, how many's ever led a person to the Lord? And, and you, you explain to them, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Confess your sins. He'll condemn you for all your sins, and you can be born again. You explain it. And then you have them pray. Now, what if they won't pray? You tell them the truth, but if they won't pray, can they get the goods? Can they be saved without believing in their heart and confessing with their mouth? No. So you explain to them, here's how you believe, here's how you confess, here's what you confess. And you lead it in them, and they're born again. And you activate them into the gift of eternal life. How many have been activated in the gift of eternal life? Say amen. amen. Good. He's trained you to say amen. Oh, some churches, I can't get an amen out of anybody. You're good at it, though. That's good. He's trained you well. I like it where you sick them, boy. Let's go for it. <laughs> I used to go hunting, and we'd get those old hound dogs, and we'd sick them. Oof, oof. They'd go out and tree a coon for us, or a squirrel or something, or <laughs> rabbits didn't get up in trees. So, <laughs> But uh, when you when you realize that you, you have that ministry and you have that calling, you're going to do something about it. Right? Now, then the Pentecostal movement came along in 1900, and they got the revelation that everybody can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's for whosoever will. Now, some Baptists had received it, just a few, some Methodists back in the 1800s, 1700s, but nobody had a revelation that it's for everybody. But they got a revelation, it's for whosoever. Amen? And it, how many's ever prayed for somebody to get the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues? You know, I was raised in Pentecost for a while. We'd pray for you, rub you, massage you, <laughs> shake you, work on you. If you would, it would try to shake it out of you if you couldn't, if you, if you weren't going to speak. And, uh, but we learned uh, in, in the charismatic movement more that instruct them, tell them what to do, and then lay hands on them and have them believe they receive it and let them start speaking in tongues. I probably prayed for 10,000s of people receive the gift of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. Now, in the prophetic apostolic movement, we receive the revelation for activating people in their spiritual gifts, in their prophetic gifts. You see, if you can activate a key eternal life, you activate the gift of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, you can activate the gifts of the Spirit. You've already got them in you. I said you have them in you now. How many, has it, how many that have received personal prophecies, was there any indication that you had a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or prophecy or faith or working on miracles? Did anybody get? All four of you, okay. You say, well, I don't want to know now if I got to be responsible for it. <laughs> I, um, I really want to really pray for you because you're coming into the third reformation. You're crossing over your Jordan. You're coming to your Canaan land. You're coming to your destiny. You're, you're like David going from Hebron to Jerusalem. You're coming into your spiritual Jerusalem, your spiritual ultimate. You know, David was, see, when I got that word, I've even kept you under my own purpose. I had no idea what that purpose was. And I was, that was, that was in 53, I received a prophecy it was 30 years later, 1983, that I got the revelation of the company of prophets, and God says, I've kept you. I didn't let you become popular in the, in the Pentecostals. I didn't let you become popular in the Charismatics or the faith people. I kept you for the prophetic, and I prepared you for the prophetic, and that's what your purpose is. You're called to raise up a company of prophets to restore the prophet and apostle back into the church, accepted, received, and we've been doing that for since 19. 83, 84, 85, and then 88, the, the birthing of the prophetic movement. But you have a purpose. It may not be worldwide. It may not be beyond your back door. But you have something. And I know each and every one of you, like I said in that little clip, I want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, we do training in the prophetic, as I said. We've trained on every continent. We have over 34 churches in China that's being trained in the prophetic. We have School of the Prophets in, in Russia, all, all over the world. It's worked. 
just like the evangelicals activated people in eternal life, Pentecostals activated people in the gift of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, we activate people in the gifts of the Spirit. They're all by the same Spirit. Come on. They're all by the same, it says, by one is given, by the same Spirit, by the same Spirit. So, let me tell you, if you will ask the Lord to activate my gifts, Lord, and let me be useful and use what I have, help me know more about it and use it, I'll be willing to be instrumental in your hand. Would that be your prayer? I'm going to pray for you that God will do that and release you in that. Because, you know, used to I'd get discouraged looking at people that were, you know, 80% of the congregation is over 60. I tell you, but now that I'm 87, I'm looking at you with great hope and faith and vision. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. You know, when we, we've trained people in the prophetic from 6 years old to 80, 85 years old. And I've never seen anybody I couldn't activate in the prophesying. Paul says you may all prophesy one by one. Paul, uh, the scripture says, it's the only thing the Bible tells you to earnestly desire, other than the desire of the sincere miracle of the word. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 12, 39, Old King James says, covet to prophesy. You've been wanting to covet all your, covet all your life. Now you've got something to covet, to prophesy, to be a voice for the Lord, to encourage others. Amen? Now, one thing I found out by then, actually, I used to prophesy hundreds and hundreds of people back in my early days, and uh, now I've raised up hundreds and hundreds of prophesiers that do it out of all of our ministers, all of our 3,000 ministers in the world and 900 in the U.S., all, all prophesy. And I can go anywhere on the campus. I say to a secretary, you, you, come help me prophesy. I can go outside, you mowing the lawn, come help me prophesy. I can go in any other areas of the offices, and they, they've all been through a true training, all been through the school, and, and they can prophesy. And, 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 and the Bible says, earnest it is our prophecy. And then, if you get to 1 Corinthians 12 on the gifts, then it goes 13 on the love. Then in 14 it says, follow after love, Christ-like character, and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Amen. Now, I, w I wasn't sure what I was going to do today. I sought and sought the Lord. Sometimes he gives me definitely. And by the way, this you need, if you're going to be spirit, a little more spiritual, 70 reasons for speaking in tongues. 70. Most people couldn't tell you seven. But you've got a million dollar gift, and you're writing five and ten dollar checks on it now and then. I mean, if you write all the benefits, all the things that help you, all the things that speaking in tongues does for you, you'd do it a lot more. But I've discovered that we can multiply ourselves by activating the saints. Amen. How many's got a living Christ living in you? Wave at him. Is he a talking Christ, a sharing Christ? Not bashful, not self-conscious? You think if you let the Christ arise within you, he could share a word with your fellow member? I, I'm gonna, I, I wasn't planning on doing it. Is it okay if I go activate him in the prophetic? I mean, I mean I'm not doing this as, if, if, if you was all sinners, and I'd preach the salvation message, I'd activate you in eternal life, right? Come on. Yeah. If you was all evangelicals, and I'd just preach on the gift, 70 reasons for getting the gift of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, I'd all activate you in speaking in tongues. Well, since I didn't teach a lot on the prophetic, but enough that you, you know enough that I don't have to say a lot, that you need to be activated in the prophetic. And if I activate you, you're going to be activated. I mean, you're going to know the difference tomorrow. You're going to notice the difference. Suddenly, your mind is awakened in the spirit. Your soul is alive. Your spirit's activated. It works. It works. We, we, we've done it with over 500,000 people. And if you've got something that good, you can patent it. If it works that often. Amen. So here's what I learned to do. I've been doing it for 30, 35 years in 70 nations. Here's what we do. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart and speak with your mouth, you'll be saved. How many know faith only operates two places? Heart, say heart, heart. and your mouth. Heart. And, and what are we called to do if, I, if you were sinners and I had you pray the sinner's prayer, I'd have you believe in your heart and then you'd have to say something with your mouth, right? You confess with your mouth. Now, speaking in tongue and get the Holy Ghost, it's hard to speak in tongues 
with us, your mouth. See, and in Romans 10, 10, what says that faith is nigh thee in your heart and in your mouth. Faith doesn't operate in your head or your emotions or your soul. Faith operates in your mouth and your heart. You have to believe in your heart, then take action. There's no such thing as faith without action in the Bible, whether it's verbal action or physical action. And so when you pray the sinner's prayer, you believe in your heart, and you say, Lord, come into my heart. And, 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 and actually, you repeat what a preacher tells you, don't you? you yes. Now, come think about this. An old sinner comes up here. I says, now pray after me. And I'm just a mortal man up here, a preacher. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Come into my heart. Take me in my sin. He repeats that. Now, he repeats what another man tells him to say, and it activates the divine gift. Now, why do we accept that? Because it was restored before you and I came. Because it was restored in 1600. A couple of you could have been there. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's real. And like speaking in tongues. Uh, how many had a little struggle speaking in tongues? You, you sought it and sought it, but you, because, because you, had got a, you have to have a head bypass. You heard about a heart bypass? And how about a head bypass? Because it comes from your spirit, not your head. Although you may hear sounds, but you speak it out of your spirit. Now, I'm gonna, I want to activate you in the prophetic. And if you want to later, we have training in it. We can bring people in and, and, and train your elders and deacons and leaders and all the people, and, and you're going to do it. And there's, and there's wisdom and protocol. As I said, once you do it, <laughs> you got to have some wisdom and some insight and some direction. But here's what we're going to do. Lock the doors. Don't let, don't let anybody out. <laughs> You should have prayed about before you come. You're, you're here now. And, you know, I would be negligent if I was an evangelist and you were all sinners and I didn't give you an altar call. Right? If I was a Pentecostal and I preached to evangelicals and I preached on the Holy Ghost and just dismissed, didn't give them a chance to receive. Well, I'm a prophet. And I, I activate people in the prophetic. And, and God wants you to be prophetic because if you're not prophetic, you may become pathetic. And... Uh, <laughs> So, here's what we're going to do. Stand up. Now, re re repeat this prayer after me before we go any further. Okay. Father God, Father God I'm, your I'm your child. You had Jesus redeem me by his blood. You own me. You own me. I'm, yours. I'm yours. I want to be used above you. It's your purpose, your purpose that I be prophetic, that I be prophetic to, be to be able to have a voice of the Lord to bless others. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to do this act of faith, this act of faith in, confidence in confidence that it will activate the gifts within me. Within and I will expect over the next weeks, I next weeks as I make myself available for gifts to begin to be manifest in my life. I'm yours, Lord. And, I, and I'm not self-conscious. I'm not afraid. I'm not resentful the preachers are making me stand up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, here's what, we, here's what we're going to do. Uh, you're kind of scattered out, so here's what I... Uh, Wilt, you may have to help me here, down here. I, I want you to get a fellow member... Join both hands facing each other. Now, don't get your husband and wife, because man, will they get a word for you. <laughs> now, what I normally have you do is turn around. That way, you, you turn around and face the person behind you. Or, or get somebody, yes, work yourself around. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll help those way in the back there. Go back to those, over help those back there. Everybody get somebody. Just don't get your husband or wife or best friend. Everybody get somebody. Get somebody, you girls, get, get those girls. Okay, everybody got somebody, you guys get somebody, you girls get each other, hey, go get, get each other, you, want, you get, get in on this, we don't need music right now, and you get, you get, you get her, old, you get young, <laughs> y'all get each other, all right, okay, everybody got somebody, now, let me, when I ask this question, if you agree, I want you to nod your head up and down, 
Do you give your fellow member the right to exercise their faith to get a word for you and you're not going to be critical or anything? If what they give, you just come and say, bless your little heart, thank you. <laughs> nod your head up and down. Now, a stiff-necked sheep cannot nod his head up and down. So, <laughs> all right. Now, here, it's, it's, it's simple. I don't know how it works. It just works. Just how, I can't tell you how to talk in tongues. I just do it by faith. But you just, I, I tell people, that little sound, the feeling you have, you don't know, start talking. I just, I just shut my eyes and look, think about the person, or, and I just get up. To me, I get a slight impression. Some people see letters. Some people hear things. Some people get illustrations. But the main thing is not to be profound, but just get found. In other words, you're going to believe in your heart, and you got, I want you to be able to say something. I want you to speak with your mouth by faith. You just might hear one word. You might just see something. Some people just see something. Just tell them what you see, no more, no less. If you just get one word, give it. But you open your mouth and said something. You believed in your heart, and you spoke with your mouth. But you're so spiritual here, I'm expecting you to get a good word for your neighbor. Amen? All right. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to activate your spirit first. And the way you do that is pray in tongues. As you pray in tongues, you activate your spirit flow. Once the spirit flow, we're going to pray in tongues for about a minute, and then we're going to we go very quiet, and then you're going to try to get clear. If you've got an illustration, ask God to help you to explain it. If you've got a word, don't try to interpret or applica app make application. Just whatever you get, give it. it'll sound silly to you, nonsensical to you, because it's not for you, it's for your neighbor. All right, so don't try to figure it out. Don't analyze it. Just give it, okay? So let's pray in tongue for about a minute, then I'm going to go, shh. And when I go that way, you're going to go very quiet for about 15 seconds, and then we're going to minister. Okay, start praying in tongues. Rika ba 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 Yes, Lord, my fellow member, your thoughts, your heart, Lord. Look to see, listen to hear, believe to receive. See what you look. With your spiritual eyes, listen with your spiritual ears. Hear with your heart. My fellow member, Lord. My fellow member, Lord. Physical, financial, social, something, Lord. Something that will bless them. Something that will encourage them. Something that will comfort them. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Okay, shh. Shh, shh, shh. All right, silent, no, no sharing yet. Now just shut yourself then with God. See what you're seeing in the Spirit. Sense what you're sensing in the Spirit. And hear what you're hearing. And then just get it as clear as you can. But you're going to by faith speak it. Don't worry about it. Don't analyze it. Don't think about it. Just going to do it here in a minute. Now, Lord, make it real as we take a few seconds here. Make it real, Lord. Okay, now in a moment, I'm going to have you release hands, and when you do, get mouth to ear, because it's going to get noisy when everybody starts sharing. So, put men, you can reach over and touch their shoulder, shoulders up by the neck, okay, make sure you get up to the shoulder, and, uh, but get close, mouth to ear, okay. Release hands, get mouth to ear, one share, then the other one share. Here's what I sensed, felt, saw, heard. Don't say, thus says the Lord, or God told me, just share. Go for it.
Okay, f finish sharing. You should be finished sharing. Because you go from sharing to fellowship. As soon as you both the best one another, most have shared with one another, you may be seated. When you both have shared, you may be seated. We're going to minister to him and his wife. Some of you become major prophets with a long word. <laughs> okay, be seated if you're through sharing. Go ahead and be seated. Okay, now let me check, see how you did. How many got something and you shared it with your fellow member? I see. Wow. You people that spiritual? They all got something. How many got something and you shared it with your fellow member? Wow, wow. Now, when, we, when I first started this in 1977, my wife would be in the back and I'd activate people and she'd already get a weird word from somebody. I said, honey, get up front. It all good in front, you know. But, uh, but uh, you know, we worked with it and worked with it until people started getting good words, good words. And uh, how many, now, there will be some words are wait and see. And somebody just saw, you know, maybe somebody saw, had, I just saw an old fat brown cow in the middle of an alfalfa field. <laughs> well, for typology, that's better than a skinny cow in the middle of the desert. <laughs> so hallelujah, fat cow in the middle of the alfalfa field, good, I'm going to be in the midst of plenty. But uh, so th there's a wait and see words, and then there's words you're saying, but sometimes you related to it, you've been thinking about it, or you knew what it meant, or it applied to you, or it, it had, but three things that it has to do is to encourage you, is to comfort you, and, and build your faith. So how many of the words you received was a noun word that had direct positive effect upon you? Amen. Wow, look at that. Now I want to show you something. I could have dismissed 10 minutes ago, I sent you home, get apple and pie, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't have activated. Gift, my gift doesn't operate unless I'm activated by faith. Let me say that again. I'm not a spooky spiritual prophet. I don't get dreams, visions, and out-of-body experiences float in space. I just, I just act on the gifting and the faith of God. And I beg for all of those experiences, but God would never give it to me. He says you've got to teach people they just obey the word and act in faith and stir up the gift and use it. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, there's two things I normally do on Sunday mornings. Give the word that I want to minister to the leadership to fulfill, to get you on across Jordan, get you into your promised land, and get you moving and get the spirit. So is, is that your favorite wife that I'm with you? One and only. <laughs> Come on up here. <laughs> Amen. How many know God's got a sense of humor? If you don't believe me, go home and look in the mirror. He made you life with God. Come on over. Okay, we'll, we want to minister to them. Come on over. You can sit if you want to. If you're okay. All right. Okay. That's it there. Because I know how that feels. <laughs> you're, you're number one wife? Yes, hey. I'm the only one. <laughs> <laughs> better be better. <laughs> how many years? What are we now? 40? 40. 40. That's the end of judgment and the testing. Now it's all <laughs> roses from now on. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, stretch out your hands and bless your pastors right now. Father, we thank you that we can have the privileges of blessing one another in Jesus' name. And Lord, the doctor, fourth doctrine of Christ is laying on of hands. And we lay anointed hands on anointed bodies for anointed results. Now charge them in the Holy Ghost right now. Lord, the spirit of wisdom and revelation is be upon them mightily. And God, they're going to brought the people this far. They're going to take them all the way through and into Canaan. And, to their, and everyone, even Joshua had to give everyone their lot. And everyone's got a lot. Everyone's got a possession. Everyone's got a ministry. Everyone's got an anointing. And Lord, I put the, that reproducing anointing you put up on me years ago that's produced hundreds of thousands. I charge them with it right now and impart it to them with a vision, God, to, to reproduce and bring forth the saints. For the greatest joy is seeing the saints come into ministry. And Lord, though we're 80 years old or 70, 60, or 50, or 40, or teenagers or, or adolescents, God, if they all can be activated into the call of God. If they're old enough to be saved and old enough to be filled with the Spirit, they're old enough to move in the Spirit. So Lord, we just charge right now. And the Lord says, son and daughter, this is your day. This is your hour. 
I have worked with you all these years to bring you to this place. Just like Jesus went through 30 years of manhood for that day of our of demonstrating the kingdom of God and then going to the cross and being resurrected and birthed in the church. All these years of ministry have brought you to this place. And I want to accomplish more in and through you over these next few years than you produce all the rest of years because you're going to multiply yourself. You're going to multiply yourself. You're going to multiply yourself. And the Lord says, just as I chose the 12, then the 70, and then, then they chose others and multiply, multiply, reproduce. I want teams, teams, teams. I want healing teams. I want deliverance teams. I want Holy Ghost teams. I want salvation teams. I want visitation teams. I want counseling teams. I want a team for every need of mankind. And your church is a kingdom church. It's a church that's not just to bless people, not just to encourage people. That's vital. But you're called to do more. You're an apostle of revelation. Apostle of victory, an apostle of anointing, and the Lord says, Son and daughter, I've called you to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I'm making a third Reformation reformer out of you, and out of your work together as a couple. And the Lord says, Daughter, there's gifts in you. I'm stirring, I'm waking up, and, I, and you've always just kind of stood behind your husband a lot of times, but you're going to stand beside him. You're going to work as a team. You're going to co labor together. And Lord, I just put that prophetic mantle upon her now. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you for the heart of God. Lord, Jesus, Father, right now, we give him your heart. He's wanted to, he's asking you, Lord, for the heart of God, for the mind of Christ. And I charge him with it right now. And the Lord says, Son, as you start working in miracles, miracles are going to start working in you. And the Lord says, as you deliver others, your body is going to be delivered from its limitation. So fear not. Don't look at yourself. Look at my word. Look at my spirit. I want you to have miracle services also. I want you to have prophetic, and you're going to have the whole works. You're not just a partial, you're a full, and you're a full man of God. And the Lord says, Son, I've called you to it, and you're going to do it because I've called you to it. So I charge him right now. An apostolic miracle, signs and wonders, Jesus' name. And I heal that area of his body that's trying to restrict him. Let him be healed by the power of God. Be set free in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I release a work of miracles, work of miracles, work of miracles, and gifts of healing flow through this body like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. And God, even right now, we just call for the fire. God, we declare, Lord God, God, God is saying, Son and daughter, that there's a generation that He has called you guys to raise up. And at times, it feels that you have put some things on the shelf, even when you were younger. There's some dreams and visions that God has poured inside of you that He's bringing into this season right now. And God says, He calls you, man and woman of God, fire carriers, because you're going to set a blaze and start a blaze trailing, even for the young generation. And God says, He's stirring up inside of you such a passion and such a vigor just to retransform even this geographical location. And God says, He did not call you stagnant, He called you here to bear fruit. And even in the season, He says, Don't be limited by fear because it, there's a time that you guys thought you were stuck. There's a time that you saw the visions were not coming to pass but God says I had you at a place called pause for a reason and just as the archer pulls back the arrow God says the season has come for me to release you guys to hit the target and God says there's going to be such a supernatural anointing that's going to come in this sanctuary that people will have to be carried out by the presence of God but God says you guys have prayed and you guys have interceded and I also hear for the intercession team, you guys have prayed from the expectation what, what you guys have encountered in last seasons of seeing miracles and signs. But God says it's a new wineskin being birded even right now. That the miracles that are about to take place, that the signs and wonders that are about to be birded, you guys have never seen it before. God says get ready for the unexpected. Get ready for the unexpected because he's stirring inside such an anointing that even when people walk into the sanctuary, demons are going to basically be released. Release. God, God, people are going to be healed and transformed. And he says, even with the worship team, there's going to be a new level of worship that's going to be burdened that they won't even be able to worship because God says, I am sending my angelic host to camp out in this location. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I just release that river to flow. I declare everything that was blocked, everything that was stopped, in the name, we just release it, God. And we declare this is a burning of something new here today in Jesus' name. Okay. Hallelujah! Come on, you guys got.
got to act like something just happened. You guys got to act like something just broke out. Hallelujah! Amen. How much you guys enjoyed, Bishop? I just want to share with you guys briefly before I bring pastors on um, the video that Bishop showed before he started preaching. It was, was it amazing? Come on, it was amazing. So I want to just share with you guys that that video is an e-course that Bishop produced that is online where he's going to take you guys through 12 months of personal mentoring about talking about this book right here, The High Calling. I'm telling you guys, this book brought me to tears. It realigned some things in my life that I needed to <laughs> fix. So I want to encourage you guys, if you guys want to be a part of mentoring, if you guys want to sit under Bishop and hear his wisdom, visit www.bishophammond.org. And the sign-up is right there. All the information is right there. It's going to be a 12-month journey of just carrying you through your highest calling. The making the man before the ministry. Amen. Love you guys. Amen. All right. We are going to invite our altar workers to be available down here in the front. The cafe is open. The resource center is open if you want to do your giving on credit or debit card. Bishop's book table is available right out in the lobby. Come on back 7 o'clock tonight for prophetic ministry. You don't want to miss it. God bless you.